Welcome to Ubuntu Linux Desktop 14.04, the complete course for beginners. Now before we get started, we need to talk about our installation. You can either install Ubuntu Linux on a physical disk, that would be a physical installation, and this would require you to have a spare computer or a spare hard drive or a spare partition available for that physical installation of Ubuntu Linux. Now the other option is a virtual installation of Ubuntu Linux. What this means is that you can install and run Ubuntu Desktop within your current host operating system, whether that's Microsoft Windows or Mac OS or some other variety of Linux. You can use the Oracle VirtualBox application in order to create a virtual machine and run Ubuntu Desktop. Now what this means if you're not familiar with virtualization is that Ubuntu Desktop, the operating system, will virtually run in a window like any other application within your current operating system, also known as your host operating system. Now, whether you choose a physical installation of Ubuntu Desktop or a virtual installation, the installation process will be largely the same. And either way, you'll be able to follow along with my videos. I will be performing a virtual installation. However, I'll provide support and give you information on installing Ubuntu Desktop onto a physical disk in a physical computer as well. Now, there are also a few things you need to know about different versions of Ubuntu. You may have heard of Ubuntu Desktop and Ubuntu Server. Of course, this course is going to be covering Ubuntu Desktop. However, I thought you'd like to know a little bit about these two popular versions of Ubuntu. Ubuntu Server is designed to run server tasks and typically does not include a GUI or GUI, that is a graphical user interface. Ubuntu Desktop does include a graphical user interface by default and it is optimized for handling desktop tasks. If you were to install Ubuntu Server, you wouldn't have any GUI. You wouldn't have a graphical user interface. All you would have would be a command line. Now, many people are familiar with the command line from days gone by. If you ever played with an Apple II, Maybe you loaded up Oregon Trail, or you messed around in DOS. Either way, those were command lines. And that's how Ubuntu Server is going to function by default. Now you can have Ubuntu Server with a graphical user interface, but that moves beyond the scope of this course. In this course, we'll be talking about Ubuntu Desktop, which by default will come with the GNOME Desktop environment already installed. So for this course, you'll want to download the desktop version of Ubuntu. Now you may also hear about LTS builds. LTS builds, such as 14.04, offer long-term support, which includes security and software updates from Ubuntu. It's usually a good idea to install an LTS build of Ubuntu, unless for some reason you need that latest and greatest cutting edge of technology, you'll usually want to go with an LTS build. It offers you five years now, it used to be three, now it's five years of long-term support. Also, you'll find that Ubuntu comes in 32 and 64-bit versions. In short, your PC must have a 64-bit processor in order to use the 64-bit version of Ubuntu. Well, how do you know if you have a 64-bit processor? In general, the newer processors are all going to be capable of handling 64-bit applications and operating systems. However, if you have an 
older computer, you may have a 32-bit processor, a processor that will not be able to handle the 64-bit version of any applications or operating systems. Now, there are several ways for you to tell for sure whether or not you have a 64-bit operating system installed. One of the easiest on a Windows system is to simply go to My Computer, right mouse click, and you should see in that pane whether or not you have a 64-bit version or a 32-bit version of Windows installed. If you're having trouble with this, please go ahead and post in the discussion board and I would be happy to assist you since different makes and models and operating systems are going to house this information in different locations. Again, in general, if you have a newer computer, you are very likely to have a 64-bit capable processor and you would then want to download the 64-bit version of Ubuntu Desktop. However, if you have an older computer, it is possible that your processor cannot handle 64-bit programs and applications and you would then need to download the 32-bit version, also known as the x86 version of Ubuntu Desktop. That concludes an overview of everything we'll need to know before beginning our installation. Proceed to the next module and there we'll dive many right different in. ways to install Ubuntu Desktop. But first, we'll need to go to the Ubuntu website and get an ISO image file. So we'll browse to ubuntu.com. Once on the website, we'll click on the desktop button. No need to select any of these options down here. Just click on Desktop. Now, once you click on Desktop, you'll see the large Download Ubuntu button, which you can also click on, and you'll be brought to an area where you can download Ubuntu 14.04.3 LTS. Now, if this version number is different, as it will be as things progress and they make updates to Ubuntu Desktop, don't worry about that changed number. As long as it's an LTS build, and preferably Ubuntu 14, everything within this course will still be relevant. Now, over here, you'll select whether or not you would like the 64-bit or 32-bit version of Ubuntu Desktop. As I explained in the previous module, that's something that you'll need to verify with your particular processor in your computer. And again, if you're having difficulty ascertaining whether or not you have a 64-bit capable processor or not, you can post in the discussion board and I'd be happy to guide you through that process. We will be downloading the 64-bit version of Ubuntu 14 LTS by clicking on this large download button. On this page, you have the opportunity to donate to Ubuntu. We're not going to do that right now, but it is something that you should thoughtfully consider as Ubuntu is free software and developing software, well, good software, isn't free. Again, we'll go ahead and click the Not Now button and our download should begin automatically. You can see it here in Google Chrome. It has started to download and it's a rather large file so it will take some time to download. Once it's done, we'll proceed with preparing our installation media. Once your Ubuntu download is complete, it's time to determine whether or not you'll be doing a physical or virtual installation. If you're going to be installing Ubuntu 14.04 virtually, then all you'll need is the ISO image file that you've already downloaded from Ubuntu.com. However, if you would like to perform a physical installation, a more traditional installation of Ubuntu Desktop, you'll need to burn this ISO image file to either a DVD or to a USB thumb drive. Now, there are two pieces of software that I would recommend to you if you're not sure what programs to use in order to accomplish this. Perhaps you've never burned an ISO image file before. If you would like to burn the ISO image file to a DVD, then you can download a free program called Infra Recorder, which you see here. You can do that by visiting the infrarecorder.org website. Once you're on the website, you can click on Downloads over here on the right, and then you can download the installer. 
Now, if you would like to burn this ISO image file to a thumb drive, perhaps you are performing a physical installation where the computer does not have an optical drive, or you don't have any blank DVD-Rs available, you can also burn this ISO image file to a thumb drive, and it doesn't even have to be empty. However, it's recommended that it is empty. But you can do that using Universal USB Installer. Now you can download the Universal USB Installer from a website called Pin Drive Linux. That's pindrivelinux.com. Pin Drive Linux here will give you the download for the Universal USB Installer. Now I want to walk you through both of these setup processes here, remembering that you can skip the rest of this module if you're going to be performing a virtual installation. So if you're performing a virtual installation, you can go ahead and proceed to the next lecture now. However, for those of you who are performing or would like to know how to perform a physical installation of Ubuntu, we'll begin by burning the ISO image file to a DVD. Once Infra Recorder opens, we'll go to Actions and then Burn Image. We'll navigate to the location where our ISO image is stored, in this case, the desktop, and select Open. Now this will open up a new window where we can choose a few options for burning this ISO image to a DVD. Write speed can usually be set to maximum. The write method can be session at once, we only want one copy, and these down here uh, can all be checked except for simulation. We want to eject the disk after writing, although you don't have to select that. Buffer underrun is not necessary, uh, but can be checked. Pad data tracks is also not necessary, but can be checked. And we do certainly want to close the disk after writing. The only one that we absolutely do not want checked is simulation. If we have simulation checked, the disk won't actually burn. It will simply simulate burning to the DVD-R. That means the laser in your optical drive will actually be turned off during this process. Once we're done and we have the correct optical drive selected up here, and a blank DVD-R in the optical drive, we can select OK and the burn process will begin. Now, in this particular case, I don't have a DVD-R inserted, and Infra Recorder knows it. So insert that DVD-R and then hit OK to continue if the burn does not proceed automatically. If you would like to install Ubuntu using a USB thumb drive, you can open up the Universal USB Installer. Now, this program does not have to be installed on your computer. Instead, you just download this executable and run it, and then every time you open it, you'll agree to the terms, and here you can select what type of operating system you're wanting to install. In this case, we want to install Ubuntu, and we already have an ISO image file, which we can browse to. It's going to be on our desktop. Here it is, and we'll select Open, now we can select our USB drive. I have a USB drive installed here, but I don't want to use that drive. Be very careful and make sure that the USB drive or hard drive you select is truly the USB drive that you want to use in order to create a thumb drive that can install uh, Ubuntu Linux. Otherwise, you could damage that USB hard drive. You could have some data loss there. Uh, this box here will enable you to show all drives. Now, this would include drives that are not recognized to be USB thumb drives. Use that with caution. There is usually, usually, no reason to have that box checked. It just poses a risk. You would check that box, of course, if you were not seeing your USB thumb drive here, and you know for certain that the drive you have selected is your USB thumb drive. After selecting your USB thumb drive, you can also choose to set a persistent file size for storing changes. 
This is not going to become necessary for creating an installation media only, an installation thumb drive only. However, if you wanted to run Ubuntu Desktop off of a thumb drive, which you can do, you would want to have some kind of persistence. In this case, we do not need any persistence for this live copy of Ubuntu as we just want to use it as an installer. And so zero megabytes will be fine and we will then hit create. Now again, this drive does not need to be empty. However, you can choose to format the drive. This is not selected by default. If you choose to format your pen drive, your thumb drive, all of the contents, everything that's already on that drive, will be erased. So be very careful there. We do not need to erase or format everything on the USB drive in order to create a USB installer. However, just know that you can. Once you're ready to proceed, you'll click create and the process you're going will to be begin. performing a virtual installation of Ubuntu desktop, then you'll want to download Oracle VM VirtualBox unless you already have some virtualization software already installed. Oracle VM VirtualBox is completely free. You can download it from the virtualbox.org website. Here we are on the main page. We'll select Download VirtualBox 5.0, and then we have to select our platform. So whatever operating system you're currently running, you'll want to select the appropriate link here. I'm running Windows, and so I would select VirtualBox 5.0.4 for Windows hosts. If you're running Mac OS, you would want to select this link. If you're on Linux, this link and VirtualBox can even run on Solaris. You would select this link here if you were running Solaris. I'm on Windows and I've already downloaded and installed Oracle VM VirtualBox. Let's open up the program now and take a look at the basic interface. We'll walk through all of this in greater detail as we go to install and set up our virtual machine for Ubuntu Desktop. But for now, you can see on the left that I have names of different virtual machines with different operating systems as well. Ubuntu Server, remember we talked about the desktop and server editions of Ubuntu and how they differ. CentOS 7, which is another distribution of Linux similar to Red Hat. Ubuntu Desktop, which we'll be installing in a moment, but I already have installed here. Windows 7, which is different from what I'm currently running. I'm currently running Windows 10. And FreeBSD 2, which was my second attempt at installing and running FreeBSD in a virtual machine. That's another Unix-like operating system. Now, before we go any further, I want to show you around Ubuntu Desktop so you can get an idea for what we're going you to be installing. You can see here in the virtual machine that things are going to boot up like a normal computer system. And here you can see that we are about to boot into Ubuntu Desktop. I can use the host key, I'll explain that later, and F to move into full screen mode. And now it appears as if we are in Ubuntu Desktop. And in fact, we are. It's just not a physical installation of Ubuntu Desktop. So again, before we move into the installation, let me show you around a little bit. Up here, you can search your Ubuntu Desktop installation for applications and also files. Here you have the terminal, which allows you to interact with Ubuntu Desktop with a command line interface. And we will be walking through using the terminal quite a bit. Here you can open up and you can see the different directories on the system. This is a, a graphical user interface very similar to Microsoft's Explorer. And so if we bring something like that up here, you can see Microsoft Explorer and how it shows your different hard drives and then your different directories here is very similar to this, which is called Nautilus in Ubuntu Desktop. You can see your desktop, your documents, your downloads, music, all of these are different directories. Clicking on computer shows you every directory within the root directory. That's how you get around there. Then we can browse the web using Firefox, which will come pre-installed with Ubuntu Desktop 14 LTS.
We also have LibreOffice, which is a free alternative to Microsoft Office. Here you can see LibreOffice Writer, which is going to be like Microsoft Word. We also have LibreOffice Calc, which is going to be like Excel, and these can open and write Excel files, uh, as well as uh, the uh, writer, LibreOffice Writer, uh, can actually save and open .doc and .docx files. So very neat programs here. Uh, this program here is LibreOffice Impress, which is like PowerPoint. And we have our Ubuntu Software Center, which we'll be talking about. This is a great place to find free software that you can install in your brand new operating system. Finally, we have a little application docket here that allows us to change different system settings. It's kind of like control panel in Microsoft Windows. I hope you're getting excited. It won't be long before we'll be inside Ubuntu Desktop and you'll have an installation up and running, an installation of your very own. So let's go ahead and get started now with the installation process for Ubuntu Time Desktop to begin our installation of Ubuntu Desktop 14. If you're performing a physical installation, now is the time to insert the DVD into the optical drive or the USB thumb drive into the USB port of the physical computer where you would like to install Ubuntu Desktop 14. However, if like me you are performing a virtual installation, then you should already have a virtual machine set up as I showed you in the previous module. Here you can see my virtual machine, Ubuntu Desktop 2. In order to start the virtual machine, we simply double click on it. This will bring up a new window. If it's the first time that you are starting the virtual machine, then you will likely see a smaller window here, which will ask you to specify which type of media or medium you would like to boot from. If you are performing an ISO installation, you can click that Browse button. Or, if like me, you have already started the virtual machine and that dialog box is not up, you can simply click on Devices, and then Optical Drives, and then choose Disk Image. This will allow us to browse for the ISO image that we want to use to install Ubuntu Desktop 14. I will browse to Ubuntu 14 desktop and then the ISO image file that I have here and select open. I'm going to need to reboot the machine. You can double check here that under devices, optical drives, the ISO image file is selected. And now we want to reboot this machine. So we can simply go to machine and then reset. This will boot us in to our installation and we'll be given two basic options. We'll be given the option to run off of this ISO image a live CD, live DVD, that is a live copy of Ubuntu, or to install the operating system. And of course, we want to select the installation option. Here you can see the options that we're given. Try Ubuntu or install Ubuntu. We, of course, want to install it, and so we will select that button. Now, we need at least 6.5 gigabytes of available drive space. That's why previously I told you in setting up a virtual machine, you would need at least 8 gigabytes on your virtual disk image. You also, it's preferred that you would be connected to the Internet, although you do not have to be connected to the Internet in order to install Ubuntu. You can then configure the network later, but you won't be able to download updates while installing which is preferable. So what we're going to do is connect our network first through VirtualBox. Now, if you're performing a physical installation here, you would want to make sure that your Ethernet cable is securely connected to the back of the computer, at which point you should see a green check mark here. If you have a wireless network set up on that computer, then you can come up here you can click on the little up and down button, or you may see a grayed out wireless network icon. You can see that networking is enabled, and you can choose which network you would like to connect to. Now, I don't have any wireless options here because I'm running in a virtual box environment, and so it's considering it a wired network. What I will need to do is go to machine 
and then settings. You'll need to do this as well if you have a great X next to connected to the internet. Next, we'll go to network and we'll change this drop down to bridged adapter. You should then see a name here. And usually the first one that comes up will be correct. However, if you have uh, multiple adapters, then you may have to select them manually there. After that's done, click OK. And we should see this gray X change now to a green check mark. You can see up here this uh, wireless uh, icon there came on for a moment and then the up down arrows and now we see a green check mark. Now we can select to download updates while installing which again is optional but preferred and we can also choose whether or not to install third-party software. Uh, some of this is related to mp3 players and whatnot as it says down here and we do want to install that third-party software. Go ahead and select continue now that we are connected to the internet and have both check marks checked. And we'll need to select which disk we want to install Ubuntu on. We want to erase the disk and install Ubuntu. We're using that virtual disk image. Now, of course, if you're performing a physical installation, make sure that you know what drive you want to install Ubuntu on, what drive or partition. You can select Install Now, and it will go ahead and give you a warning. It's going to let you know what is going to happen to the particular disk that you'll be modifying. Make sure that you're okay with that, and then you can select Continue. Now, notice that we did not encrypt the Ubuntu installation, and we didn't set up LVM. LVM is a logical volume manager and it's just not something that we're going to cover in this course. It's a way in which you can logically link different hard drives and partitions together in order to uh, achieve some pretty cool results. Uh, we're not going to go into that detail here as this is a course for beginners. Continuing on with our installation, we'll need to select our time zone. I'm going to type in Chicago here, not that I'm located in Chicago, but I'm located in Chicago time in the United States. And so I will select that here, Chicago time, United States, and hit continue. Here you can select your keyboard layout, which for me is English US. And now we can give some user credentials here. Your name, which is not the username, but the actual name that will be attached to the account. The computer name, which in this case is OK, Cody dash virtual box is fine. Here we can specify a username, and I do recommend that your username is short and all lowercase letters. That's just going to make things a little bit easier as we begin to dig into the terminal. And please do select a secure password for your installation, as that is always a smart practice. Now, rather than log in automatically, we will require a password to log in. Please make sure that you check this uh, so that we can check out a few options. Uh, we could do that by logging out, but in order to follow along, please make sure that you select require my password to log in. And we do not need to encrypt our home folder, so we won't do that. And we can select continue. Now that we've completed this basic configuration, the operating system will begin to install and you can see its progress down here. We can get more detailed information about the progress of our installation by clicking on this little triangle here and it will drop down a little terminal window that's telling us more specifically what the installer is doing. Once this completes, we'll move on to final configurations and boot in to our new operating system. The installation is now complete. We can select Restart Now and boot into our new operating this system. This module is for VirtualBox users only. In this module, I'll be showing you how to install the guest additions for Ubuntu Desktop 14. This is going to give us many important features. The most important, at least for this video series, is a better screen resolution. You'll notice here that my resolution is very low, it's a square, it doesn't fit on the screen. However, once we install our guest editions, I'll be able to show you around in Ubuntu Desktop 14 in full 720p. So let's go ahead and log into our user account now so that we can get those guest editions installed. We'll log in and we are logging in for the first time into our system.
and we will immediately go to Devices and then Insert Guest Editions CD Image. Now what we're doing here is we're loading the Guest Editions ISO image which comes uh, in with the VirtualBox installation and this is going to enable us to install these additional features. So we'll insert the Guest Edition CD image and it should automatically be mounted and recognized by Ubuntu 14. So what we want to do here is we want to go ahead and select Run. Again, notice the screen resolution is very poor, so we can't even fit this entire dialog box into our screen. Select Run, and then enter your user password. And we are building the main Guest Editions module. After this is complete, and assuming everything succeeds, we'll give the machine a reboot and you should immediately notice a different resolution. So now we can press return to close that window, and we can reboot our system, and again we will immediately be greeted by a better screen resolution. You can see here a much better resolution and we can use the host key which is by default right control and F in order to move into full screen mode. Now we have Ubuntu desktop up and running with a 720p screen resolution. This completes the tutorial for installing guest editions in Ubuntu desktop through VirtualBox. If you have any difficulty with this whatsoever, please post in the discussion board and I would be happy to answer those questions and make sure that you get guest this editions is for running. VirtualBox users only. If you've installed Ubuntu Desktop in VirtualBox, I'd like to show you around the program that is VirtualBox itself, so you better understand how to use it. Most of our work will be done within Ubuntu Desktop in full screen mode. We can access full screen mode by clicking our VirtualBox host key, which by default is right control. Now if you're not sure what your default host key is, just look in the lower right hand corner of the virtual box window, the virtual machine window like we have open here, and you should see right control or some other button specified there as your host key. Whatever key is specified here is your host key, and again by default it is right control. We can use that host key and some of the other keys on our keyboard to achieve different things. First of all, using right control and F is going to move our virtual machine into full screen mode. You can go ahead and try that now. Moving out of full screen mode is equally simple. Right control and F will take us out of full screen mode. Now we're in windowed mode and in windowed mode you can see that with guest editions installed the Ubuntu resolution is going to try to automatically change. You can see here it's uh, actually freaking out a little bit based on what we're doing. This is not scaling per se. That is, VirtualBox is not scaling. The operating system with our guest editions is actually scaling on the fly. And you can get some errors like that every now and then. However, you can enter an official scaling mode with VirtualBox. Go ahead and make your window smaller than the entire screen. Use the host key, right control, and C to move into scaling mode. Now, scaling mode is something that VirtualBox is doing to adjust your resolution. So this is not using guest editions. You should be able to use scaling mode even without guest editions installed. You can see, however, that it is linked to a particular aspect ratio in scaling mode, and you can't change that unless, of course, you try and trick it by changing your settings within the guest operating system. So this is scaling mode, and I recommend against using scaling mode because you don't always get clicks in the right spots of your window, and there's no reason to use scaling mode once you have the guest editions installed. So let's move out of scaling mode with right control and C back into windowed mode. And now you can see at the top of windowed mode we have several options. You have your uh, standard uh, file, uh, um, file menu up here at the top. So you have file, machine, view, input, devices, and help. Let's go over a few of those options now. File is going to allow you 
to manage your virtual machine and virtual box preferences here. There's really nothing in here that's going to be life changing. So we're going to move right on from that to your machine settings. Machine settings are very important. There are a lot of them. They do different things and I encourage you to dig into them on your own, but we'll give you a brief overview of the basic settings that you'll need. You have system settings here and notice that they can't be modified right now because the virtual machine is running. Display settings, which also cannot be altered except for the scale factor because the virtual machine is up and running. Storage settings here, managing virtual disks that can be attached to the virtual machine. Audio settings, network settings, we've already been here to adjust our network settings and uh, put this to a bridged adapter so we could get a firm internet connection. Serial ports, USB, this is going to deal with the USB devices that are connected to the virtual machine itself. Shared folders, something we haven't talked about yet, uh, that is going to enable us to transfer files from our virtual machine to our host operating system and vice versa from our host operating system to our guest operating system. In this case, our guest operating system is Ubuntu Desktop and user interface options as well. Now remember that some of these options are grayed out, so we'll need to shut down our virtual machine. We can do that within the operating system and that's usually preferable. However, if we click on the X up here in VirtualBox in windowed mode, we're going to receive several options. We can save the machine state that's kind of like saving where you're at. So you're going to save and pause the virtual machine. Send the shutdown signal, which is going to attempt to shut the system down from within the guest operating system itself. Or we can simply power off the machine. Now, powering off the machine is not what you want to do most of the time. Powering off the machine would be the same as pulling the plug on a physical computer. It's not a good clean shutdown procedure. So you can choose either to save the machine state or send the shutdown signal. Let's go ahead and send the shutdown signal now and hit OK. You'll notice that the operating system has received that shutdown signal and it brings up our regular Ubuntu options. These are the same options that we would receive if we were to go up here to the power icon and select shut down. We want to shut down the system and so we'll click on shut down now and the virtual machine will close. This brings us back to our virtual box uh, program itself, and we can now adjust more settings in our virtual machine. With the machine selected here on the left pane, we can then click on settings and we'll notice that our options are no longer grayed out. Now that the machine is shut down, we can change some of these options. Now, do we need to change any of these options? Not necessarily. It depends upon what you're trying to do and it depends on the computer that you're using. Display, for example. If you're trying to accomplish something within the virtual machine that would require a lot of video memory, then you would naturally want to adjust these settings. However, if you're not trying to do anything that would require a high amount of video memory, then you could leave it down here. I'm going to go ahead and bump this up to 128 megabytes because that's not going to be a huge hit for my host operating system. There's no reason for me to not give 128 megabytes to this virtual machine. I just want to use one monitor. A scale factor uh, can remain at 100 unless you're seeing blurry text. And then you can sometimes raise the scale factor in order to get uh, more crisp and clear text on your monitor. You can also choose to enable 3D acceleration or 2D acceleration. I'm going to go ahead and enable 3D acceleration again because there's no reason for me not to do this as I have the computer resources to do so. Now again, there are a lot of options here. Storage options where we can create other virtual disks and attach those to the virtual machine, but we don't need to do that for the purposes of this course. And I want to keep things as simple as possible. So if you have questions about any of these virtual box settings, please let me know. Create a discussion thread here within the course and I'd be happy to answer those questions. But for our purposes now, as long as you have a working internet connection, everything's looking good and the guest editions have installed, you should be able to follow along with the rest of this course. Welcome to Ubuntu Desktop 14. Here we are greeted by the login manager 
and you can see our username in my case Cody Ray Miller here and a box to input our password so input your password as you specified during the installation and select enter in order to boot into the system now this is the main screen for Ubuntu desktop let's go over a few basic things first of all we have a launcher over here on the left. This is a part of the Unity desktop interface that Ubuntu 14 uses. At the very top of the launcher, we have a search feature where we can search for files as well as applications and those suggestions will come up in real time. We also have on the launcher files which will open up our file manager which by default in Ubuntu is called Nautilus so this would be like Windows Explorer or the finder in Mac OS 10 below that we have Mozilla Firefox automatically installed although we can install other browsers including Google Chrome or Dolphin browser if we would like to do that now a difference between this kind of interface this kind of graphical user interface and Windows systems in particular is that as we maximize a window let's use this Firefox window as an example by double clicking up here on the top of the bar we can maximize the screen and our top bar becomes embedded up here at the very top so it's no longer separate we can take it and pull it and drag it down and you can see that there's still a bar up here which is attached uh, and will provide functionality for the window we have selected. This may not be new to you if you're familiar with Mac OS, but if you're coming to Ubuntu from Windows systems, this might not make a lot of practical sense to start with. Just understand that as we can have two different windows open, this top bar is going to change depending upon what we have selected. You'll see that it says files up here. That's the selected window. If we shift over to Firefox, it changes to Firefox web browser. This will now bring up the file menu for Firefox. If we are over here in the file manager, that is Nautilus, and we go to file, we would now be doing something, whatever we selected here, within the files window instead of Firefox and again when we maximize these windows their top bar becomes integrated with the top bar of Ubuntu desktop again we can click hold and drag down in order to separate that screen out now we also have by default LibreOffice installed in Ubuntu desktop this is going to be a free alternative to Microsoft Office. We have LibreOffice Writer, which is like Microsoft Word, LibreOffice Calc, which is like Microsoft Excel, and LibreOffice Impress, which is similar to Microsoft PowerPoint. Now we also have the Ubuntu Software Center here and this is where we can select new applications, new programs to install in Ubuntu. Don't worry, we'll go over all of these applications in much greater detail. I just want to show you what's on your launcher to start with. So let's close out of these programs and Calc and LibreOffice Writer as well and you can see that we also have an Amazon button as well as a system settings launcher and because we inserted our guest edition CD on our virtual box machine you can see here that we have a CD mounted as well you may not see this on a physical installation unless of course you have some sort of DVD or CD in your optical drive at which point Ubuntu should automatically mount it and place it down here on the launcher Finally on the launcher we have the trash can which works much in the same way as it does in Microsoft Windows or Mac OS. You can right mouse click on the desktop in order to create a new document. In this case we'll select an empty document and give it a name. I'll give it the name trash since I want to show you how we move this to the trash can. Click hold and drag it down to the trash and that's pretty basic functionality that you should be familiar with from any operating system. Now over here on the top right, 
we have some additional buttons. This up down icon is letting us know that we have an Ethernet connection. You may see something that looks more like a fan or a radio signal up here, and that would mean that you have a wireless connection active on your Ubuntu desktop installation. Now we also have our language icon, which in my case is English US, that's our keyboard layout as well. And we have a volume slider where we can set the master volume for the system, followed by a clock, a timestamp, which we can click on in order to bring up a calendar. Finally, we have our power button here. Selecting the power button, we can learn about this computer. We can get Ubuntu help. We can go to system settings, which would take us the same place as the system settings launcher on our left sidebar. We can also choose to lock the system, which will not log us out of our session, but will simply lock the screen and require a password. We can log into a guest session, or we can log out entirely. We can also suspend our session, and we can choose to shut down the system. Let's go ahead and do that now. Select shut down, and you'll see that you'll be greeted with two options here. You can either restart or shut down the system. Let's go ahead and give it a restart before we proceed on with the next module. Hopefully, you're already finding Ubuntu to be very intuitive. You have applications over here on the launcher. If you would like to find a particular program, then you can search for it by clicking up here on the Ubuntu logo and then selecting the type of application that you would like to search for. For example, if I'm looking for an email program, I can type email in here and notice that Thunderbird Mail comes up even though email is not in the name of the application. If you're not familiar with Thunderbird, this is the default email client in Ubuntu 14. It is made by the same folks who make Firefox web browser. It is a very good utility, a good application. Uh, I like it very much. It's completely free. You can also download it for uh, Windows if you would like to do that. Now, one of the most popular applications that we'll get to in a little bit is going to be the terminal. We're not going to talk in depth about the terminal right now, but this is one of the things that sets Ubuntu apart from other operating systems. You see, Ubuntu and Linux in general have not completely moved on from a command line interface. They haven't completely moved on from this idea that users can input things on the command line and really give commands directly to the system without a graphical user interface. I don't view this as a limitation, rather I view it as an advantage. Nevertheless, it can be a stumbling block for new users to Ubuntu or any Linux distribution. Let's go ahead and open the terminal now by clicking on its icon. This brings up our terminal window where we can input commands directly to the system. For example, ls. Type ls and then hit enter. This lists the contents of our current directory. Again, for now you don't need to know how to use the terminal. We'll cover that in a separate section. However, I would like for you to close out of that terminal window, click on the Ubuntu logo, and take this terminal icon, click hold, and drag it over here to your launcher just below the Ubuntu logo. This is a way that we can add any program to the launcher, but I specifically want you to add the terminal to the launcher as we will be using it later. Let's also go ahead and move Thunderbird to our launcher. Click, hold, and drag it to the launcher. Let's put it right below Mozilla Firefox. Now that's one way that we can add things to the launcher. We can also rearrange things on our launcher if we would like to do that. So click the logo to move out of search mode. And now if we want to, we can rearrange our icons on the fly. I like having LibreOffice all together, and I'd like Firefox to be above Thunderbird, and so I'll organize my icons like this. As with any complete desktop operating system, there are a host of system settings that you can modify in Ubuntu Desktop. You can get to the system settings pane by clicking on the gear and the wrench on our launcher on the left-hand side of our screen. 
Single clicking will bring up the system settings pane. You can see that there are a variety of options and they have categorical headings such as personal, hardware, and system. Under personal we have appearance, brightness and lock, language support, online accounts, security and privacy, and text entry. Now we won't be covering all of these different setting screens because that would be too much information. It would be way too boring and frankly you would want to refund on this course because it wouldn't be any good. However, we are going to go over a few of the basic system settings that are most popular and understand that if you do have a question about a particular setting or setting pane, you can ask me in the discussion board of this course. Now let's look at appearance. This is a popular setting pane. Here we can set our desktop background. We can also change the size of our launcher icons. Notice how they have shrunk over here on the left or expanded if you bring it up. 48 is the default setting for the launcher icon size and I like that just fine. Again we can change our background if we would like to do that. I think this is a good looking background. And we can also change some basic appearance behavior such as enabling workspaces which I've already done. Notice that when you enable workspaces a new icon appears on the launcher. Look down here on the lower left side of the screen as I click enable workspaces. This is the workspace switcher which we will cover in this course so go ahead and enable workspaces now. Moving back to all settings another popular setting pane is the displays pane. This is going to enable you to adjust your screen resolution as well as manage multiple displays if you have more than one monitor connected to your Ubuntu desktop computer. Moving back to all settings, you can also see that we have mouse and touchpad settings, network settings, power settings, printers, sound, and if you have a touch tablet you can set that up here as well. Under system, the most popular settings are going to be software and updates, time and date, and user accounts. Let's go ahead and open up the user account setting pane now. You can see our user account here and our account type which is an administrator as well as the language and login options. We do have a password specified and we have automatic login off. Last login will give us a date and timestamp here but we're currently logged in so it simply says logged in now. We can click on the history button in order to see when that user has been logged in and when that user has logged off. Those are the basic settings that we'll cover in this module. Remember that if you would like information about any of these settings, you can post in the discussion board and I'd be happy to cover those a little more thoroughly with you. But since I don't want to bore you to death, let's move on to some more interesting features in Ubuntu Desktop. In this module, we'll talk about Ubuntu development code names and we'll also take our first steps in the terminal program. Now starting off, let's talk about the development code names. What are they? Well, all versions of Ubuntu have a development code name. In the first version of Ubuntu 4.10, the code name was Warty Warthog. This was apparently an inside joke between the developers who said that the first release of Ubuntu wouldn't be very polished. That is to say, it would have a lot of warts, it would have a lot of flaws. And so they joked that that first version should be called the Warty Warthog release. Well, in fact, it was called the Warty Warthog release. Ubuntu 4.10 was codenamed Warty Warthog. Now, you'll often hear in Ubuntu circles, people will simply name the adjective. So they'll say, I'm running Ubuntu Warty. They won't bother saying Warthog. So I'm running Ubuntu Warty, and that would let people know that they're running version 4.10. Sometimes you'll even hear them together. I'm running Ubuntu 4.10 Warty or Ubuntu 4 Warty. 
Now, getting a little bit closer to modern times here, we can look at Precise Pangolin. This was the first release that really dived into the Unity interface. Uh, it took some big steps forward. And so this is when a lot of people started checking out Ubuntu for the first time with Precise Pangolin. So people might say, I'm running Ubuntu 12 Precise. Or they could say, I'm running Ubuntu Precise. Of course, you could say you're running Ubuntu Precise Pangolin 12.04 LTS, but that's a bit of a mouthful. Now, this might seem like useless history, just random trivia that you don't need to know. But in fact, when we start delving into package management and installing software, it becomes important for you to understand the code name of your operating system. It's not absolutely essential for new users, but it's a good idea that you understand we'll be running Ubuntu 14.04 LTS Trusty Tear, also simply known as Trusty. Now, for whatever reason, Ubuntu has decided that on the About This Computer option, which you can reach in the upper right-hand corner by clicking on the Power button, they won't list the code name here in the graphical user interface. I think that's a failure on the part of Ubuntu's team, since they're still tied to these code names, and users really need to know the code name of the operating system they're running. For whatever reason, it's not available here, as I think it should be. Instead, we'll need to dive into the terminal and run this command, lsb underscore release, and then a space, dash or hyphen, a. Let's go to the terminal now. Remember, I asked you to put the terminal on your launcher. If you don't have the terminal on your launcher, you can type terminal here to access the program. And again, if it's not on your launcher, I would ask that you would please click and drag that over to your launcher for easy access. So open up the terminal and you'll be greeted with a new window where we can connect using a command line interface to the computer itself. Now remember the command that we're going to be running. LSB underscore release dash A. Let's bring up our terminal here and type in lsb underscore release, then a hyphen and a. Now we'll hit the enter key and we'll be greeted with some information about our system. In particular, we're given the code name, which is trusty. We know from our list over here in Firefox that Ubuntu 14.04 LTS is fully codenamed Trusty Tear. However, as I told you many times, people will simply refer to the first adjective in order to identify the particular version of Ubuntu that they're running. So now you know that you're running Ubuntu Trusty. That is Ubuntu 14.04 Trusty Tear. And that is an LTS build, which, if you'll remember, means it's a long-term support build. In this module, we'll talk about the Ubuntu Software Center and how to use it for finding, installing, and removing applications from our system. Go ahead and open the Ubuntu Software Center. You'll find it on the left-hand side of your screen, by default, on the launcher, just above the Amazon icon. Click once on the Ubuntu Software Center icon to bring up the Software Center pane. Here, we can determine what kind of software we would like to install, or we can search for software using the search bar here at the top. Let's go ahead and install a game by clicking on Games on the left-hand side of the Software Center. Now we're greeted with some top-rated games at the bottom and some categories of games at the top. We can also take a look at all the games that are found in the Ubuntu Software Center, and it tells us that there are 946 of those games. Let's click on Card Games and a list of programs that we can install, a list of card games, will be brought up. Now we can easily see ratings for our applications, and by clicking on the name of the application a single time, we are brought up with the option to install that application or to get more information about the application. Let's go ahead and click on Poker TH and then More Info. This will bring up more information about the particular application we had selected. 
First of all, it tells us that this is a free application. And again, we have an install button over here. You can see a screenshot of the application, which gets larger as you left mouse click. And you can also see reviews of the application down below. You can see here, somebody thought it was a good game, but a little wacky. Nice, does what it says. Now you can check for more reviews if you're not quite sold on an application yet. Otherwise, you can see here some people didn't like the game. We can simply scroll up and click on the install button. Now you don't have to install this application, you can choose any application, but go ahead and find a piece of software in the Software Center and install it. Remember that you can install the application from the More Information pane, as you see here, or, moving back, from the list of applications, you can simply left mouse click a single time on the name of the application and then click the Install button. Again, I want to install Poker TH, and so I'll do that by clicking on the Install button. Once I click on that button, the installation will commence, prompting me first for my password. Go ahead and enter your password there. And now we can check on the progress of our application by clicking on the progress icon up here at the top of our screen. You can see that it's downloading. 1.6 megabytes of 15.1 is currently downloaded. Once it's downloaded, it will automatically install and we'll be able to use our new application. Once the installation completes, you'll be brought back to whatever screen you were previously on as the progress icon will disappear. Our new game, Poker TH, is now here on the launcher and we can access it by single clicking on the icon. This brings up our game, which tells us to have a lot of fun. Now that might seem a little bit silly, installing a game here. As I've said, you're welcome to install any software package that you would like, as long as you understand the installation process using the Ubuntu Software Center. But what if you're looking for specific programs? Remember that you have a search bar up here in the top right, and we can search for an application such as Google Chrome. Now you'll find, interestingly enough, that Google Chrome is not available in the Ubuntu Software Center. That has to do with the end user license agreement, as well as there being some non-free portions of Google Chrome. However, if you like Google Chrome, you may also enjoy Chromium. Chromium is a web browser that you can find in the Ubuntu Software Center and you can download it as it is 100% free and completely open source. This is not a knockoff of Google Chrome. Rather, Chromium is a web browser built from the same source code that Google Chrome is built from. It just doesn't have some of those non-free parts. Now, I hear some of you saying, I want to use Google Chrome. That's what I'm used to using. Why isn't it available to me in the Ubuntu Software Center? In fact, I think this can be a bit of a hurdle with new users, but there's an easy workaround for popular packages such as Google Chrome, popular applications such as Google Chrome. I'll show you in the next module how you can download a Debian package file, which is going to be like an EXE file on a Windows system or a DMG file on Mac OS X in order to install Google Chrome specifically, but many other applications in general. You won't find EXE files, that is executable files, or DMG files if you're more familiar with Mac OS X, that is an Apple disk image file. Instead, here in Ubuntu, we'll find .deb files, which serve essentially the same purpose. Now, a .deb file is a Debian package file. Debian is a version of Linux that came before Ubuntu on which Ubuntu is based. So Ubuntu is a Debian-based operating system. Therefore, we can install Debian packages in Ubuntu. In this module, we'll specifically be looking for Google Chrome, downloading the .deb file, that's a .deb file, and installing it through the Ubuntu Software Center. Let's navigate now to google.com 
forward slash Chrome to bring up the Google Chrome homepage in Mozilla Firefox. Here on the Chrome page, we can download the application and it automatically knows that we are running Ubuntu and therefore you see here our options. We can download a 32-bit .deb package, a 64-bit dot deb package or 32 and 64 bit dot rpm packages do not download the rpms as they will not work on ubuntu an rpm package is going to work on fedora OpenSUSE, red hat centos other such versions of linux but for ubuntu and all other debian based operating systems we'll be downloading the dot deb package now remember whether or not you installed the 32-bit version of ubuntu or the 64-bit version of the operating system i installed the 64-bit version and so i'll be downloading the 64-bit dot deb package for google chrome now we can accept and install and remember that this end user license agreement is a part of why Google Chrome is not available in the software center. We want to save this file and it will automatically be saved in our downloads directory. So once this download completes, I'll show you how to navigate to your downloads directory. Our download is now complete. And so we'll navigate to our downloads directory by launching Nautilus over here, our file manager by default in Ubuntu. And we'll click on downloads and find Google Chrome stable current amd64.deb. If we double click on this package, you'll notice that the Ubuntu Software Center automatically opens and it will automatically load that Debian package file. Notice the warning here to only install this file if you trust the origin. We do trust the origin because we know we got it from the Chrome homepage and so we'll click the install button. This will take care of our installation as with any other application that we found in the Ubuntu Software Center. You may be prompted for your password during the installation of new software. In fact, you will be prompted for a password with just about any installation of software. Don't worry about that. It should not be a problem. Just make sure that you type your password in correctly and then click authenticate. You can see now that Google Chrome has been successfully installed. You can also see the message that this program is run from a terminal and the code in order to run it from a terminal. Don't worry, that's not actually correct. Some software will be run from the terminal. Google Chrome, however, does not have to be run from the terminal. You'll notice that there is not a launcher icon that has automatically been added for Google Chrome. However, clicking on the Ubuntu logo and then typing in Chrome will bring up our familiar Google Chrome icon, which once again, we can click hold and drag over to our launcher. I'll put that right above Firefox here. Now we can open up Google Chrome by clicking on the icon and it will ask, as is standard on any operating system, whether we want to make Google Chrome the default browser. I'm going to uncheck that as I prefer Firefox. And we can also choose whether we want to automatically send usage statistics and crash reports to Google. Yet again, I'll say this is one of the reasons that Google Chrome is not found in the Ubuntu Software Center. Some people consider this feature tantamount to spyware. Now, I don't think it's anything to worry about personally, but that's just helping you understand why Chromium is in the Ubuntu Software Center and not Google Chrome itself. I'll go ahead and check that box, hit OK. And you can see that Chrome has launched here in Ubuntu Desktop 14. So what about that message that said we needed to run Google Chrome from a terminal? Well, we know that's not true. We found our Google Chrome icon and we were able to launch it using our graphical user interface. However, as I am trying to ease you into the use of the terminal, go ahead and control C to copy this line, Google hyphen Chrome hyphen stable or you can memorize it, it's not that long. Open up a terminal, 
And now with control shift V, you can paste that in and hit enter. And you'll notice that in the background, Google Chrome has launched. So that is one way that you can start Google Chrome from the terminal. And in fact, you can start any application from the terminal. I've already told you that our file manager is called Nautilus. If we want to start Nautilus, we can type Nautilus into the command line and hit enter. And you'll see our file manager, Nautilus, opens up as well. So that's a simple way that you can use the terminal to execute programs to open up applications on the system. However, at this stage, there's no need to do that with Google Chrome or any other application presently installed on your Ubuntu system. Let's talk a little bit about compression in Ubuntu Desktop. You're probably familiar with zip files, especially if you're used to using a Windows system. However, even on Mac OS X, it's very likely that you've seen zip files. However, in Linux, there are two other very common types of compressed files. Those would be the tar.gz files and tar bz2 files. Now these are very similar to zip in that they're simply compressed files or a compressed file that has been brought together in a zip or a tar.gz or a tar.bz. Now in Ubuntu desktop dealing with these compressed kinds of folders and files is very simple. So if we want to open up a zip file we can simply double click on it. Now we have the option, as we would with any operating system, to extract the files. We can even add files to the archive, that is, add additional files to the zip file. Or, instead of hitting extract over here, which would allow us to select where we would like to extract the contents, we can simply select the contents of this zip file, and we can drag and drop them to our desktop. This will do the same thing as extracting them. And I hope that you're familiar with this uh, concept from other operating systems. Shouldn't be anything too new there. However, again, people who are new to Linux may be confused by the tar.gz and tar.bz2 files. Just know that these are essentially the same as zip files. They're archives which have compression attached. The tar.gz file has gzip compression applied, where the tar.bz2 file has bzip2 compression applied. So if we want to extract the tar.bz2 file, we can double click on it as we did with the zip, and then we can either drag and drop the folder out to our desktop or wherever we would like to extract those contents, or we can click on the extract button, and we can then browse to a location and select extract. You can see the operation is complete. You can quit, show the files, or close the message. The same is true of tar.gz files. The same methods will apply here. You can drag and drop, or you can select extract in order to open up the contents of those files. Now, if you would like to create a compressed file, you can do that by right mouse clicking on a folder, or additionally, you can right mouse click on files themselves. Let's go ahead and select all of these files. Right mouse click on one of them since they're all selected and click on compress. We can now choose what type of compression we would like to apply. The familiar zip, tar.gz, tar.bz2, and a host of other options. Let's go ahead and zip all of these up and we'll hit create. You can see now that the archive was created. We can choose to open it or close this message. And here you see the compressme.zip file. Now it's named compressme because that's the name of the folder in which these files resided. But if we open up the zip file, we see that it only contains these three files that we selected. We'll now move this to the trash and go back to our desktop and right mouse click on the folder itself in order to compress it. This time, let's choose a new compression algorithm, tar.gz, that'll use gzips compression, and select create. 
This has created the compressedme.tar.gz archive. And now if we double click on this file, we'll see the compressed me folder inside. Inside this folder, we have those same documents. But notice the subtle difference. When we right mouse clicked on the folder and compressed it, the folder was added to our archive. When we selected the files themselves and right mouse clicked and compressed them, the archive only contained these files. Again, this should be very familiar to you. The only thing new here is the addition of tar.gz and tar.bz2, which you will see very frequently when working in Ubuntu desktop, downloading files, installing programs, and scripts. As with Microsoft Windows and Mac OS X, Ubuntu is going to try to keep itself up to date. From time to time, you may see the following dialog prompt. The software updater will tell you that updated software is available for your computer. Do you want to install these updates now? We can look at the detail of our updates here. That is what's going to be installed, what is going to be updated. We can also look at technical descriptions of these particular updates here in case we'd like a little more information about them and what they are and what they're doing. Or we can change our software updater settings. These are important. You can tell it to automatically check for updates on a, a daily basis, every other day, weekly, every two weeks, or never. I recommend daily. When there are security updates, should the computer display them immediately? download them automatically or download and install automatically this is my preferred selection here if i change anything have to enter my user password when there are other updates when do we want to see those i like weekly here because there are very frequent updates to ubuntu and other software that's installed and i don't want to see that dialog box all the time now this is the final option notify me of a new ubuntu version which is also very important and will by default be set to for long-term support versions. This means that you'll only be notified of a new Ubuntu version if it is a new LTS version of Ubuntu. Ubuntu comes out with new versions regularly, however they're not all LTS builds. And if you update from an LTS build to a non-LTS build, you of course lose that long-term support. So I find that it's best to only upgrade from one LTS build to the other, and we can do that by selecting this option here. Notify me of a new Ubuntu version for long-term support versions only. You can of course select never or for any new version. Just remember to be careful here as you can move away from an LTS version without really being aware of it. Those options all look good. And so I'm going to go ahead now and install these updates by selecting install now. The installation process is going to be fluid. It will require our password, but after that, everything is going to be downloaded and installed automatically. No need to worry about it. You can take a look at the details here if you'd like to see what's going on, or you can simply minimize the software updater and go about your business. Let's talk a little bit about compression in Ubuntu Desktop. You're probably familiar with zip files, especially if you're used to using a Windows system. However, even on Mac OS X, it's very likely that you've seen zip files. However, in Linux, there are two other very common types of compressed files. Those would be the tar.gz files and tar.gz bz2 files. Now these are very similar to zip in that they're simply compressed files or a compressed file that has been brought together in a zip or a tar.gz or a tar.bz. Now in Ubuntu desktop dealing with these compressed kinds of folders and files is very simple. So if we want to open up a zip file we can simply double click on it. Now we have the option, as we would with any operating system, to extract the files. We can even add files to the archive, that is, add additional files to the zip file. Or, instead of hitting extract over here, which would allow us to select where we would like to extract the contents, we can simply select the contents of this zip file, and we can drag and drop them to our desktop. 
This will do the same thing as extracting them. And I hope that you're familiar with this uh, concept from other operating systems. Shouldn't be anything too new there. However, again, people who are new to Linux may be confused by the tar.gz and tar.bz2 files. Just know that these are essentially the same as zip files. They're archives which have compression attached. The tar.gz file has gzip compression applied, where the tar.bz2 file has bzip2 compression applied. So if we want to extract the tar.bz2 file, we can double click on it as we did with the zip, and then we can either drag and drop the folder out to our desktop or wherever we would like to extract those contents, or we can click on the extract button, and we can then browse to a location and select extract. You can see the operation is complete. You can quit, show the files, or close the message. The same is true of tar.gz files. The same methods will apply here. You can drag and drop, or you can select extract in order to open up the contents of those files. Now, if you would like to create a compressed file, you can do that by right mouse clicking on a folder, or additionally, you can right mouse click on files themselves. Let's go ahead and select all of these files, right mouse click on one of them since they're all selected, and click on Compress. We can now choose what type of compression we would like to apply, the familiar zip, tar.gz, tar.bz2, and a host of other options. Let's go ahead and zip all of these up, and we'll hit Create. You can see now that the archive was created. We can choose to open it or close this message. And here you see the compressme.zip file. Now it's named compressme because that's the name of the folder in which these files resided. But if we open up the zip file, we see that it only contains these three files that we selected. We'll now move this to the trash and go back to our desktop and right mouse click on the folder itself in order to compress it. This time, let's choose a new compression algorithm, tar.gz, that'll use gzips compression, and select create. This has created the compressme.tar.gz archive, and now if we double click on this file, we'll see the compressme folder inside. Inside this folder, we have those same documents, but notice the subtle difference. When we right mouse clicked on the folder and compressed it, the folder was added to our archive. When we selected the files themselves and right mouse clicked and compressed them, the archive only contained these files. Again, this should be very familiar to you. The only thing new here is the addition of tar.gz and tar.bz2, which you will see very frequently when working in Ubuntu desktop, downloading files, installing programs, and scripts. As with Microsoft Windows and Mac OS X, Ubuntu is going to try to keep itself up to date. From time to time, you may see the following dialog prompt. The software updater will tell you that updated software is available for your computer. Do you want to install these updates now? We can look at the detail of our updates here. That is what's going to be installed, what is going to be updated. We can also look at technical descriptions of these particular updates here in case we'd like a little more information about them and what they are and what they're doing. Or we can change our software updater settings these are important. You can tell it to automatically check for updates on a, a daily basis, every other day, weekly, every two weeks, or never. I recommend daily. When there are security updates, should the computer display them immediately, download them automatically, or download and install automatically? This is my preferred selection here. If I change anything, I have to enter my user password. When there are other updates, when do we want to see those? I like weekly here because there are very frequent updates to Ubuntu and other software that's installed and I don't want to see that dialog box all the time. Now this is the final option, notify me of a new Ubuntu version, which is also very important and will by default be set to for long-term support versions. This means that you'll only be notified of a new Ubuntu version if it is a new 
LTS version of Ubuntu. Ubuntu comes out with new versions regularly, however, they're not all LTS builds. And if you update from an LTS build to a non-LTS build, you of course lose that long-term support. So I find that it's best to only upgrade from one LTS build to the other, and we can do that by selecting this option here. Notify me of a new Ubuntu version for long-term support versions only. You can of course select never or for any new version, just remember to be careful here as you can move away from an LTS version without really being aware of it. Those options all look good and so I'm going to go ahead now and install these updates by selecting install now. The installation process is going to be fluid, it will require our password, but after that everything is going to be downloaded and installed automatically, no need to worry about it. You can take a look at the details here if you'd like to see what's going on, or you can simply minimize the software updater and go about your business.